regular viewers to this channel will know that I like to tell the stories and celebrate the achievements of many flyers from the interwar period. Thanks to them, long distance travel isn't as difficult as it used to be. And having flown the Atlantic several hundred times, the Atlantic pioneers have always been of interest to me. Chance discovery after a transatlantic flight in December several years ago heightened that interest. I'll tell you the story. I was in Washington DC at Dulles International Airport and having a spare day spent it at the magnificent National Air and Space Museum. Whilst I was at the museum I got a message on my phone telling me of a charter the following evening. Take the aircraft to Teterboro, New Jersey and then fly a handful of passengers over to Le Bourget, Paris. It was an easy flight over and we arrived late afternoon into a grey cold Paris. In spite of our passenger's promise for many years that all she wanted for Christmas was me, it wasn't true. She disappeared in a blaze of press photography and we were left to clean up the aircraft. We were parked down at the south end of the airfield. I went out to do my post-flight walk round in the fast fading light and my torchlight fell on an object which I initially thought was a drain cover, but it wasn't. It was this stone tablet set into the concrete commemorating Charles Lindbergh's arrival on the 21st of May 1927. We'd just flown the same route, but for us it had barely taken six and a half hours, and when I got to the hotel the same evening, I started reading about his flight. Back in the 1990s, my parents had given me a copy of A. Scott Berg's biography of Lindbergh, but I didn't appreciate at the time how accurately he had flown the shortest Great Circle route from New York to Paris, now, having lived in Cornwall for over 20 years, I realised how close he must have flown to my home. This gave me an idea. On the evening of the 21st of May this year, I set off from Roach. When Slim took off from New York, he barely cleared the telephone wire at the end of Roosevelt Field. Tubby, taking off from Roach, merely had to contend with those 21st century contrivances, the solar farm and the wind turbines. I set a course to the northwest, aiming for Travaux's head.
I very bravely flew at least one mile offshore, around the Quees Rock, and then made a beeline for the mainland. I don't really like single engine over water. As I coasted in, I set the lubber line on the compass to 100 degrees, the wind corrected heading for Plymouth, and then waited for Slim to arrive. He was going like the wind, having made an accurate landfall in southwest Ireland, realizing he was ahead of time with plenty of fuel left. He increased the revs and was cruising at 110 miles an hour. He wanted to make the French coast before night fell. After all, he'd been flying for over 30 hours already. I marvelled at his navigation. Euronka has a P-series compass, where the magnet inside, you can see the T-shape, sloshes around in alcohol. Who doesn't? And the outer part, which is locked with that brass lever, has a grid which the pilot or navigator aligns with the inner. It's reasonably accurate and was used on British aircraft until the 1940s. The Vickers Vimy, flown by Alcock and Brown in 1919, had a cockpit not dissimilar to my vintage Vauxhall. Alcock, with no blind flying instruments, had to accurately fly the headings calculated by his navigator Brown. Barely eight years later, Lindbergh had the benefit of a pioneer earth induct compass. This was a remarkably ingenious device. Using a spinning coil driven by a fuselage mounted anemometer, it created an electromotive force using the earth as a magnet. There's a very good description of the earth induct compass on Wikipedia. Suffice to say here that Lindbergh could select the heading he wanted to fly on the controller on the right, and then the galvanometer on the left would give left-right indications to help him steer an accurate course. The Ryan cruised at a nominal 100 miles an hour, and the distance from New York Roosevelt Field to Paris Le Bourget was 3,610 miles. This is Lindbergh's chart. He meticulously planned course change every 100 miles or one hour. The MC marked on the chart his magnetic course as measured by him prior to the flight. Lindbergh later told Sir Alan Cobham that to have flown this flight solo without an earth induct compass would have been impossible. He had certainly flown and navigated remarkably accurately. Actual landfall at Dingle in the southwest of Ireland was within three miles of his original planned track. Another small but vital piece of equipment that made Lindbergh's flight possible was the turn indicator. This is a simple gyroscopic instrument driven by air suction from a Venturi. I have one in Euronka seen here. This is a British pattern instrument with two needles. The top needle, unfortunately rather ruined by my reflection, shows skid or slip and it's just a pendulum. The bottom needle shows rate of turn. So I'm now turning right then I'm coming back towards wings level. The turn indicator in the Ryan MYP was of American pattern with a single needle showing rate of turn and a slip ball. Both instruments work in exactly the same way. To provide some pitch information, Lindbergh had a Riker inclinometer fitted to the instrument panel. The curved top tube gave near identical information as to the slip ball. However, the vertical tube, although subject to acceleration errors, would have given pitch information to be used in conjunction with the airspeed indicator and altimeter. Given that the view out of the Spirit of St. Louis was fairly poor at the best of times, this was a sensible instrument to fit. And thus, with these simple instruments, Lindbergh was able to skillfully fly the aircraft blind. I continued on my course towards Plymouth, passing just north of Bodmin. I could see home in the distance, thus proving that had I been there on the evening of the 21st of May 1927, I might well have seen Slim fly past.
15 minutes or so later saw me approaching the Rain Peninsula. Slim's own diary and contemporary observations show that he flew south of Plymouth City across the Sound. This suggests his route was about three miles south of, although paralleling, the map that I generated using the Jepson software. I had flown from Travaux's Head to Mount Edgecombe, and I think this is the most likely track Slim flew across Cornwall. Just short of Mount Edgecombe, I bade farewell to Slim. He was well ahead of me anyway, and I turned to the west for home. Lindbergh coasted in at Cherbourg just as darkness fell. The airways beacons from Cherbourg to Paris had been lit for him to follow, and he made his first night landing in the Ryan after 33 hours and 30 minutes airborne. Nearly a century on, and Charles Lindbergh remains the most famous airman in history, largely because of that one flight. Alcock and Brown, who had made the first non-stop transatlantic crossing in 1919, are less well remembered, although this is no fault of Lindbergh's. Alcock and Brown were two very different characters, but their trust and faith in each other's abilities made them a formidable team. Jack Alcock was the gregarious, outgoing one, but he was killed in December 1919, flying the prototype Vickers Viking to an exhibition in Paris. His death affected his great friend Arthur Whitton Brown very much. Brown, always a diffident character, spoke little of the flight after Alcock's death and went back to his work at Metropolitan Vickers. His only son, also Arthur, was killed in 1944 in the crash of a mosquito, after which Whitton Brown became a virtual recluse. He died in 1948. Their Vickers Vimy never flew again. It was repaired and then presented to the Science Museum at a ceremony on the 15th of December, 1919. Alcock and Brown were there. Alcock was dead three days later. At the time of their flight, civil airlines were in their infancy. Most airliners were converted World War I bombers, and they tended to navigate by following railway lines anyway. If one wanted to get somewhere fast and reliably, it was better to take the train. As we've already seen, by the time of Lindbergh's flight, there were some great advances in aviation technology. When Lindbergh returned from Paris, he flew a further 400 hours in the spirit of St. Louis, crisscrossing the continental United States and further, promoting aviation. It is estimated that a quarter of the American population saw Lindbergh and the spirit of St. Louis during these tours. Of course, it had a massive effect on the American aviation industry, and up to a point still does today. In 1954, the British Lion Film Corporation announced plans to make a film about Alcock and Brown. A replica Vickers Vimy was built by Shawcraft models of Ivor Buckinghamshire. It wasn't flyable, but powered by two Ford V8 engines, it was capable of taxiing at 25 miles an hour. Unfortunately, later that same year, the British Lion Film Corporation went into receivership and the film, which was to be called The Long Hop, was never made. In 1957, Warner Brothers made the film The Spirit of St. Louis, starring James Stewart as Charles Lindbergh. Somewhat surprisingly, it wasn't a box office hit at the time, although more recent evaluations accept that it was a very accurate portrayal of events in 1927. James Stewart was twice the age of Lindbergh when he made the film, but as a decorated airman and lifelong Lindbergh fan, he really wanted to play the role. Charles Lindbergh died in 1974. I had been flying for over an hour and a half when I got back to Roach. The weather was perfect. It had been a brilliant evening, remembering three very intrepid airmen.
Thank you for watching.